OK, uh, so now let's talk about how we actually configure DNS. So in order for the, D the IP address, 156 dot something, to map to CNN.com, someone had to somehow set that up. And we need to somehow figure out how DNS servers know what answer to return. So to do that, we have a number of different types of DNS records. So basically, inside of the DNS server is this big database of information, or basically a big Excel spreadsheet with these rows. And each of these rows can have a different type. So this, for example, is actually what the DNS uh, for CSE1.net looks like. So here at the top, or at the bottom, sorry, we have this. So this IP address here says that this is the IP address for www.cse1.net. So that means that I had to buy that domain, cse1.net, and we'll see in section how you can actually buy that domain. And now I also had to rent some web server. So I said before that I'm just renting this web server from this nice company in New Jersey that charges me $20 a month to put my stuff there. And so now, once I have this web server, this web server has an IP address, because that company made sure that my server had its own IP address and other people could access it on the internet. So now I also bought this domain. That means I control it, I can do whatever I want to it. So now I basically said in this panel here, I want to set my domain to point to this IP address, because I know that this is the IP address of my server. So the panel actually looks something like this, so I can zoom in. So here is simply a row that says www.cse1.net. I want you to go to this IP address here. So there are also some other types of records that DNS can store. If we flip back, so that we just looked at what's called an A record. In an A record, or an AAAA, really original uh, for IPv6 addresses, is something that just maps a domain to an IP address. So this is kind of the most basic thing you can do with DNS. But we also have some different things. Uh, for example, a C name. In a C name, rather than mapping a domain to an IP address, it kind of maps a domain to another domain. So this is kind of a, a, an alias, you could say. So for example, if I flip back to here, we can see here that cdn.cse1.net is actually just an alias for cdn.computerscience1.net, which is just another domain name, and it's hosted somewhere else. So because I've created this entry in DNS, when someone requests, what's the IP address for cdn.cse1.net, my DNS server is going to say, I don't know, but it's just the IP address for cdn.computerscience1.net. So this is just some kind of handy way for, to create aliases. For example, if I go to mail.cse1.net, that's just aliased to Google's Gmail. So this is, they told me if you want to use this, then just create this CNAME record that aliases mail.cse1.net to a domain that I can use Gmail on. So those are the two major ones, uh, but some other types of DNS records are MX, which has to do with email. So we'll look at email closely next week and how that all works. Um, but when I receive an email to staff at cse1.net, something has to happen. It needs to be sent somewhere so my message can be delivered. And, M excuse me, and MX records are kind of what makes that happen. And finally, um, this top one here, this name server, is basically how I told some root uh, some TLD domain server where to look. So somehow I needed to say, well, if I have this .NET and you need to look for some other server that's going to respond, this is how I told a, a, DN a TLD DNS server to come look at my DNS server, which happens to be, for CSE1.NET, this thing here, ns1.linenode.com. So this is some DNS server managed by Linode, which is just the company I'm renting my server from. And this is where this file is actually stored. So all of my DNS information is stored on this server here. And when I look, and when a TLD server needs to look for CSE1.net, it's going to say, OK, I'm, I'm the server for .NET, and I have an entry that tells me to go here when I'm looking for CSE1.net. And so that's kind of how we set up that communication. And so we, that, that hierarchy exists. And this is how I kind of get into that hierarchy. I can't really modify a root DNS server, um, but the root DNS server is just going to delegate to the TLD. And this is what tells the TLD DNS server, hey, I know where CSE1.net is. Pick me. Any questions? OK.
So just briefly, uh, let's talk about TLDs. So we said before that these are kind of the, the .coms and the .nets of your domain. And so here are a few common ones. So originally, when we first set up the internet, um, we had this grand idea that, oh, anything that ends in .com, it's going to be commercial. And anything that ends in .net is going to be a, a network, you know, whatever that means. And, and you know, now we just kind of degraded. You know, I can buy kind of whatever I want and make it whatever I want. Like CSE1.net is not a network. I don't even know what that would mean. Um, but some of these are still restricted. For example, I can't go and buy a .mil, uh, which is reserved for the US military. Similarly, I can't go out and buy a .gov, uh, which is for the US government. Uh, what I could do, though, is instead of buying whitehouse.gov, if I bought, for example, whitehouse.com, uh, which somebody did a few years ago and kind of set up this really malicious site. So anyone looking for the White House just assumed it'd be whitehouse.com. Uh, so the system kind of has fallen apart now. You can kind of just buy whatever domain you want and host whatever you want there. So prime example of this are these things called CCTLDs, or country code top-level domains. So basically, any country now uh, has its own TLD. And we've delegated control of that TLD to the country, to the country that owns it. So for example, that .co.uk is managed by the UK. And the UK decides what happens with those domains. So it's not up to the US who can buy a UK domain. It's up to some organization in the UK. So again, uh, that's just kind of like, you know, a, a nice vision, but we've kind of done this. We've kind of used these country codes uh, because there are so many of them to create these cute words. So for example, uh, the country code for Montenegro is .me, uh, which is you, uh, Apple has this, uh, and now this, this other site is about.me, which is just kind of like a cute sounding domain, uh, but they're totally abusing uh, these country codes. Uh, there's also one of my favorites, this is kind of shut down, uh, Yahoo bought them, uh, but del.seo.delicious, basically, uh, taking advantage of the .us TLD. My favorite CCTLD being this last one here, uh, .tm, because it's my initials. And so I can have a fun TLD that's just for me. So recently, uh, there is this startup company, this, this kind of small business, um, that was using their, their site name was art.sy. So it reads as artsy. But any guess as to what TL, CCTLD.sy belongs to? Syria. So there's some things happened in Syria recently uh, that weren't so great. And as a result, the site actually lost control of their domain because like, internet access was shut off. And so people couldn't access their site because Syria was in charge of art.sy. And if you actually read the article, uh, these people did something ridiculous. Like they delegated like power of attorney to like a Syrian lawyer. And like they jumped through all of these crazy hoops. That was a terrible idea just to get art.sy. And so if you, for example, you see you know, these sites floating around like bit.ly, um, there's not just anything that can be at the end of these domains, but there's a good chance um, that if it's kind of cutesy, it's actually a CC TLD, which means that someone actually had to go through the Libyan government in order to get it, which is, is a lot of work for maybe not a whole lot of return. Um, but if you really want that URL, then go for it. So in addition uh, to these CC TLDs, there's actually a movement going on now um, that will allow people to petition to register their own TLD. And so here's this massive list of basically all of the uh, pending ones. So you know, for example, Acer Computer wants to register something.acer. So if you went to something like laptops.acer, that would actually be a valid domain name, and it would probably sell you some Acer laptops. Any guesses as to how much it costs to even apply for this? So the domain, just to put it in context, the domain name costs about 10 to 15 bucks a year. How much do you think it costs to apply for one of these? 100 million? 100,000? Other guesses? 799. <laughs> RJ says 799. <laughs> it's actually about $185,000 uh, to apply for one of these. So that means that all of these people, all 56 times, oh, there you go, almost 2,000 people have paid almost $200,000 just to apply. And now this organization called ICANN, uh, which is basically an internet governance body that kind of keeps track of uh, how we're handing out these various domain names, they get to either approve or deny you. So you could have just wasted $200,000 uh, to try to register something.airbus, which is really useful for like two domains. <laughs> so the people who actually give you these domains are called registrars. Um, so if you watch the Super Bowl, there is a certain commercial that uh, got a certain amount of attention uh, by a registrar called GoDaddy. And unfortunately, GoDaddy is a fantastic service uh, who has interesting marketing choices. 
Um, but what GoDaddy does is it's their responsibility for interfacing with this organization called ICANN that kind of governs when we're handing out um, these domain names. And so GoDaddy, there's also uh, Network Solutions, which is one of the very early people in the internet, uh, and Namecheap. And all they do is they kind of file the paperwork to get you your domain name. And you pay them some amount of money um, to basically manage all of that for you. So once you have a domain name, uh, like CSE1.net, then you can start using your server's DNS to configure where that domain name goes. And so you get that domain name, as we'll see in section, from what's called a registrar. OK, so let's shift gears a little bit. And rather than just talk about domains, let's talk about the rest of this thing called a URL. So a URL uh, just stands for a Uniform Resource Locator. And as you might have guessed, a URL is just some way of identifying something on the internet. And so we call that something a resource. So a resource could be something like CSE1.net. There's some content there, and you get some, something back when you request CSE1.net. But then you could also have a URL like CSE1.net slash pset slash pset3. And it looks like this is just some way of identifying now a PDF document. So it just so happens that this is actually the folder structure that I have on my actual machine. So if I navigate to this directory, so this is basically um, all of the files that are located on CSE1.net. And I actually have in here a folder called PSETS. And if I go into that folder called PSETS, this is where the actual documents are sitting. So we can see that my URL, which remember was just slash PSETS slash PSET3, was kind of like a folder and file thing, right? I have a folder called PSETS slash a file called PSET3.pdf. So we call this, PC, this PDF file a resource. And this is a way of locating this resource on the internet because this URL is unique. There can only be one thing at this URL. So that's how we can actually get it with this unique locator. So the, this is an example uh, URL that has all of the possible things a URL can contain. And so hopefully you don't ever actually access a URL that looks like this. So the first part here is called the scheme. And this is going to tell the server how you're going to be communicating. So this thing called HTTP is basically a standard for two computers on the internet to communicate back and forth. It's basically a format for messages. So if I, I have a request to a server, I'm going to basically fill in a form and make, the same, make a request in the same format as everybody else. So kind of a standardized protocol for clients and servers communicating. We'll take a much closer look at HTTP in particular, but for now, uh, next week, um, but for now, just know that this is kind of the way information will be transferred back and forth. And pretty much any time you go to a web page, there's a really good chance you'll be using HTTP or HTTPS. So next, uh, we have some authentication. Um, so HTTP has built in um, this way of kind of password protecting resources on a server. So the server can say, unless you have this username and password, you're just not allowed um, to access this file or this other resource. So you can actually build that right into the URL. So rather than going to this page and getting a little pop-up and typing in your username and password, some sites will allow you to just kind of put it in the URL. It will kind of do the equivalent of auto-completing the username and password for you. So why might this not be the best way to log into Facebook? If Facebook supported this, which I don't think they do. Why might, why might a site not want to allow this? Yeah, so your password's right there. So if anyone's kind of looking over your shoulder as you're browsing Facebook, not only do they see you know, all, the embarrassing, all your embarrassing photos, they also see your password, which is potentially more embarrassing. So next, we now have the domain name. And this is what we've seen before. So example.com is this domain. And this foo.example.com is what's called a subdomain. So we saw before when we had mail.cse1.net or cdn.cse1.net that these are basically dividing this domain name even further. So it can have any number of subdomains. And each of these subdomains can map to a different IP. So next, we have something called the port. And we'll, basically, we'll take a look at this uh, a little bit later next week. But basically, a port is a way, for example, for someone to run two web servers on the same machine. So if I wanted to have one web server powering this website and another completely different type of web server powering another site, I can use ports to do that. And basically, when we talk about HTTP and these other protocols, each of them has a port associated with them. So usually, uh, you don't even see this inside of the URL because the browser assumes that if, they doesn't, if it doesn't see one, it's going to use the port number 80, which is something that's just been defined. And we'll see all of that 
later. So don't worry too much about the port and the scheme right now. But next, we have this thing called the path. And we saw before that on CSE1.net, when you get that PSET2 PDF, this path is basically corresponds to where that server is sitting, where that file is sitting on my server. Next, we have something called the query string. And the query string is how we can pass information to a web page. So for example, if you're on the lectures page of e1.net and you click this, the URL you're going to get is this URL here. We see slash video question mark v equals lectures one lecture one. And so this is a way of basically passing some information to the web page. So I'm saying what video do I want? Well, I want the lectures one lecture one video. So now let's look at the path of this URL, though. So the path here is just slash video. And I don't actually have a file called video sitting on my web server. So while sometimes the path could actually correspond to a file on disk, it doesn't have to. So you can't assume, for example, um, that something in a path is actually a file that's sitting there on disk. But a lot of times it can be. And finally, this thing here is called the fragment. And this is just some other way of storing information in the URL. Usually, this is used by the client, where the query string is used by the server. So those are just names for the different parts of the URL. So the query string, uh, the term for that way the query string is formatted, is called key value pairs. And the idea behind a key value pair is that you'll have something that looks like this at the top. So my key here, we're calling query. This could be something I'm passing to Google, maybe. And this is a way of just a standardized format for transferring information from my client to the server. So right here, I'm going to send two keys. I'm going to send a value for the key query. I'm looking for a CSE1. And I'm going to send a page number. So I'm looking for the page three. So this is just some way of having my client transfer some information to the server. And the server can do whatever it wants with that information. So the server could say, well, I'm getting requests from a client. But that client needed to tell me what page number they want. And they could have put that page number in the URL. So I can say, rather than kind of you know, looking through and trying to figure it out, I can just say, what is the value for the key page? So we'll see this more next week. But when we say key value pairs, it's just a standardized way of encoding some information. We'll see different types of encoding information. And this is just one of them. So we run into some problems if we want to send a value that looks like this. Because it turns out that that ampersand means something, and that question mark means something. Question mark, for example, means that here comes a query string. So we can't just put a question mark in the URL. So we have to do is use this thing called URL encoding, which basically is much like ASCII, just a mapping. So we have this mapping from a question mark to this other character. So here's a list of some URL encoding things. So if you ever see, for example, and there was a comment on. So if you see, for example, in a URL, percent to b, that just means that we're actually encoding a plus. So just like in binary, we encoded a capital A with the number 65. Here, we're just arbitrarily encoding a plus with a percent to b. Just because we can't just put whatever we want in a URL because things like the colon and the question mark actually mean things. So that's a URL. You may also have heard the word URI. Um, so these actually aren't the same thing, although they're kind of commonly conflated. The difference being a URI is simply a way of identifying something, where a URL is a way of locating something. So for example, if I have something like 33 Oxford Street, that's a way of locating a building. But it's also kind of a way of identifying that building, right? Because there's no other building at 33 Oxford Street. So when I say 33 Oxford Street, that means that, OK, that's, that's the building I'm talking about. On the other hand, something like an ISBN. An ISBN is a way of uniquely, locating, of uniquely identifying a book. But looking at this ISBN, I don't know where to buy it. Right? Like I, I know that this ISBN happens to identify one of the best books ever, Alice in Wonderland. But it doesn't tell me where I can go to Barnes and Noble and pick it up. So we would call this a URI, where a URL would kind of describe a location. So that's just kind of abstract. Um, but a lot of people would just kind of use URI and URL interchangeably, um, because maybe URI just like, sounds cooler than URL. But they actually have this subtle difference, where URL is for locating, URI is for <coughs> identifying. So URLs can also be URIs, but not every URI, like this ISBN, is a URL. So that's just kind of what those words mean. So we said before um, that this thing here, 
corresponded to an actual file on disk. But a lot of times, URLs won't do that. So to close here, we're going to talk briefly about this thing called an API, which is another buzzword that you may have heard. And an API is basically a way that a company can make its information available to other people. So for example, a really cool API is this one here. So the MBTA actually makes available all the positions of all of the trains. So for example, this is the red line. And if I look at this URL here, it looks like I have slash lib slash something slash red dot json. So their API says, if you go to this URL, you're going to get back some information about the red line. This information just happens to be encoded using this thing called JSON. But you can see here that we kind of have key value pairs. We have a key stop, alewife, we have a key seconds, 810. And that could mean, well, it's about 810 seconds until a train gets to alewife, which isn't realistic because trains are not that fast, at the MBTA at least. So this is kind of a way of encoding information so Facebook also might have an API. This is basically just a way for Facebook to share information with people who use it. So rather than going to my Facebook profile to get some information, if I actually just go to this URL here, um, api.facebook.com slash me, I'm going to get some information from my Facebook profile. Like there's my Facebook ID, and there's my first name. So this API is a way for Facebook to expose information to other people. So that kind of exposes information on your profile, but your profile has a lot of other stuff. So instead, an API is just this set of URLs that someone writes. Facebook said, by the way, if you go to slash me, you're going to get this information. And this API is just a way for companies to expose their information to other people. So that's all that really uh, commonly, word, commonly used term means, just some company making its information available to other people, this kind of standardized and easier to use format.